Welcome back to Bots and Thoughts, the hyper automation podcast sponsored by Salient Process. I'm your host, Jimmy Hewitt, aka Mr. Automation. Uh, well, thanks again for being on the show today, Ryan. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. As am I. Thank you for the invite. Really appreciate it. Looking forward to it. Why don't we get started with uh, a little bit of um, getting to know you for the audience. Who is Ryan Roberts? All right. So again, as you mentioned, my name is Ryan Roberts. I'm the VP of Continuous Improvement at Air Methods. Um, and so what our company does is we do air medical transport. So if you think of your medical helicopters, we our company does that. Ambulances with wings. Ambulances with wings, as we also like to call it, ICUs uh, in the sky. Oh, so, that's awesome. Which is, there, there's a lot of uh, really deep clinical trauma expertise in our helicopters that we were there to save patient lives. And we're, so, we're, we're a mobile ICU in the sky, which is really great. It's such a cool company to work for. Um, we're here at the OPEX conference. So before I ask you about what got you into the space, I'd love your <laughs> definition of OPEX. What is operational excellence or continuous improvement through your lens? Yeah, um, through my lens, operational excellence, continuous improvement, lean, six sigma, all of those different things. It, it's really, to me, it's a mindset and it, mm. it's less of a team. It's less of a, a list of tools or methodologies or, or processes, it's really is how you go about your everyday. It doesn't matter if you're in a healthcare industry, if you're flying in a helicopter, or if you're in a manufacturing, you're doing aerospace, you're in a grocery store, you're doing all kinds of things. It's a mindset. How do I continue to improve it? How do I make this process and in turn your life, your, your, your job better each and every day, each and every minute. And then that's how I've approached all of that through, throughout my whole career. It's waking up and looking at, okay, how do we do this better? How do, how do we make this better? Whatever this is. And so that's how I approach everything. And I try to instill that uh, with the teams that I work for as well. It's a mindset. I think we had a, an episode that said before you approach hyper automation, it is not a project by project approach. It is a mindset. So that's, that is definitely a big theme. Not everybody's built that way. Right. Not everybody is honest with themselves, where they're at, with their department, with their team, with their performance. Um, do you, do you find it hard to maybe instill that mentality or that mindset into the teams or divisions departments that you, that you help? Yes and no. And, and I say that a little bit because in my experience, a lot of that is you're inherently not born with it per se, but that you've just, you get that and you know that, mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of people that have grown that weren't inherently like that, that through teaching, coaching, development mm -hmm. that they got there. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little bit of both. And, and right now, some of the things that I'm, and I'm, really sorting through with is understanding who those people are and how do I identify and, and leverage that. So I don't yeah. think it's, it's not a, it's a little bit of both in, in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, That's great. Do you know Jim Collins? Um, good to great. Yes. Very First much so. two, then what? Yep. I feel yeah. like this space, this continuous improvement is definitely a first two, then what space. It really is. And, and what's funny is I've worked with a ton of operational excellence colleagues in, in the past and they're all very different. And I really didn't understand the differences and the nuances until I got to the position I'm in now to really understand, okay, you really need a, a mixed bag of certain people to make your team effective. You can't have sure. all the same note of a person. Correct. Diverse. Whether that's squad. absolutely very diverse, whether that's a very good core technical person. If you have 10 of those out of 10, you're going to have a lot of great technical solutions, but they may be but a little bit it. awkward to work with, you know? Right. So there's the, that's the experience I've, I found is it, it takes all kinds and you really have to have that diversity. Um, 
to, to make sure that you have a very effective team and honestly to make very effective improvements because the ones who are raw, so to speak, they inherently get it, but they're just not honed. They don't know what they're doing. Um, it's like a rookie running back, mm -hmm. right? They're raw. They have a lot of great talent, but mm -hmm. you just kind of hone them in. They're just running all over the place. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate working with those types of folks because you can hone them in, but yeah. they inherently get it. Yeah. And the ideas they come up with are fantastic. And it doesn't take a lot for them to, oh, what if we did that? Well, yeah, let's do that. Now, honing them on the how to do that, how to approach that, how to work with other people, how to collaborate. That's where uh, a lot of the challenges come from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally get that. You can't teach that mentality. Um, you can train it to a certain degree. Um, I also find some resistance in adopting this mentality with some, say, department heads being resistant to change. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like you need a, a willing subject, if you will, for a continuous improvement project, um, opt in. And this is starting to speak to executive support, leadership alignment. Um, what are your thoughts on on executive support, leadership alignment, let's say you as the VP of continuous improvement are tasked with improving how a particular division department or process works today, but that the VP of that division or department or process owner um, doesn't have that mindset yet. They don't have that mentality right. yet. Um, have you run into that? How do you get around that? Or is that just not how you go about continuous improvement? I've actually experienced that directly. Oh, so wow. I had that exact same scenario. Uh, my previous employer, we were tasked to, you know, I worked at a, at a university medical center. Mm. And my assignment was the ambulatory clinic. So all mm. of the outpatient clinics. So you have your, um, we had an oncology clinic, you had your orthopedics, you had allergy, you had primary care, just a whole litany. Mm -hmm. And so my task was to improve patient experience, Great you know, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. So improve the experience. And we had certain KPIs that we had to meet. It was, there was a satisfaction score. There was um, wait time, which was huge for patients, um, clinical outcomes. There was a litany of these KPIs. And my approach was, as I've always had this, is you have to involve the people. You, you cannot just come top down and say, you're going to do this and standardize this new process across the board because an orthopedic clinic is very different than primary care, very different than children's. You can, you just, you can apply similar, but you can't apply the same thing. And from a change management standpoint, it's not going to stick. If you say, okay, something from the, the COO or the chief nursing officer is going to say, hey, you're going to do X, how many physicians are going to say that? They're going to say no. So what my approach was to our, our um, chief ambulatory officer, I said, look, we can do this. It's going to take time. But what I need is literally every single person and employee within the clinic to carve out a day to sit with me and we're going to workshop this. Wow. We're going to get ideas. We're going to look at the current process. We're going to get your, your challenges. We're going to do everything and everything and everything is going to come from them. And then we're going to create an action plan and execute. As you can imagine, the pushback was very great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they said, you can't close a clinic. That's mm -hmm. money. How dare you? No one's mm -hmm. going to work on a Saturday. No one's going to do this for you. And it was a lot of negotiation in doing that. And they hired consultants to have their, their way. And I said, look, if you want to go that route, fine. But I'm out. I can't do this. Mm -hmm. They came a little bit to their senses in, in a bit. But I kept pushing. And the thing that triggered it, was as you, as you mentioned, it takes one, it only takes one. And so there was one physician in our, um, it was an allergy clinic. And I think that did some other things. This is years ago, but an allergy clinic, he said, I'll do it. I'll be your guinea pig. Mm -hmm. I'll, I, w our Fridays are, are pretty empty anyway. Can you do a half day or six hours? Can we go noon to six? Yeah. I'm like, great, let's go. So they closed the clinic early, closed it at noon. We shut the entire thing down. Every medical assistant, every nurse, every physician who has way better things to do than to sit on a Friday afternoon listening to me do a workshop. We did it inside the clinic. So we were at the source. We didn't go to a, a hotel room. We didn't go mm -hmm. to a conference room. We literally had post-it notes and flip charts 
within the clinic. Down the hallway of the clinic. Down the hallway of the clinic, <laughs> in the waiting room. We did yes. all of that. Um, and it was, it was a success right away. And then it became a pull. I didn't have to ask anymore. As soon as they started advocating for it, as soon as they started saying, this is great, it just, they said, okay, who's next? Who's next? Who's next? And then from trying to pull to get one, we had a schedule of the rest of the 30, 40 that we had to do Mission over gone. the next 18 months. And I was like, okay, now it's just execution. Oh, that was that great. so cool. <laughs> that was so good. It starts with one. Um, that almost sounds lucky that that mm -hmm. allergy physician raised their hand. Sometimes it, I guess it takes, it takes a combination of, yeah, you know, I'd rather be lucky than good. Absolutely. Um, and there, there was a lot to do. Yeah. With that. Uh, I mean, it was, our team was relatively new. I mean, we had a, a massive team of three people. So <laughs> it was, we didn't have a lot to really hold our weight on as far as, okay, you've proven yourself. We, we had to prove ourselves somewhere. And that, that was the start, yeah. starting point of it. So. So what was the outcome? You said it was a success. Um, there was a win involved with that team. Yeah. How did we start to incrementally improve the, the patient experience? Um, we identified quite a bit. And so what we, what we understood was a lot of the ideas were very simple. Mm -hmm. And as, as, we, as we find in, in any operational excellence um, initiative, it's not rocket science. You don't have to have a massive transformational effort. Yeah. They all blamed the computer system. They all blamed, they blamed the patients, which I thought was fascinating, mm. <laughs> but it was everything external except for themselves. But a lot of it was just simple communication. Mm -hmm. That was really the key theme was simple mm -hmm. communication, um, and visual, visual metrics. Mm -hmm. Uh, the great thing about that, again, a little bit of luck. The great thing about that is we had a, kind of a think tank IT team that was the innovation team mm. that they, they were tasked to just create stuff, which I thought was brilliant. And I, I, I wish I had that now and I don't have that, but it was just, it was an awesome team and they created a digital real time map of the clinic mm. that showed wait times flashing red. If a patient was in there for too long, in every TV in the in the clinician's room, it had it in the nursing station, so they can go up and look and say, "Oh, someone hasn't seen that patient in over twenty minutes. It's flashing red. Let me go in there and talk to them." Oh my gosh! And it was they absolutely should, brilliant. They should prioritize that. And I believe they were working on that. I've I've since left the, the organization. Yeah, and I don't know where that where that is, but I hope they put a patent on that because <laughs> that combines like three different disciplines into one. Yes. Visual management is a Lean Six Sigma concept that typically sits in the manufacturing floor. You mark the outline of your wrench with a piece of tape in the form of a wrench so that you know where it belongs mm -hmm. when you're done using it. Visual management. Um, then you have workflow management that tells you where to be and what to do next so that you don't have to think about it. And then, um, so you've got the visual management with the red, you've got workflow, where to be, what to do, and it's digital. Mm -hmm. So we aren't, you know, constantly running into the conference room to see where we're at on the whiteboard. Right. So you've got a digital workflow, visual management system as a solution. That is brilliant. It was great. And I've that, never heard of that. And that helped, that helped sell. But it also, we had to have significant change management around that because there was this element of big brother. Oh, you're mm. just going to watch me. You're going to, yeah, as a physician, you know sure. where I'm at because we could see, oh, the physician is in this room because a lot mm. of times what we found is where are they? Yeah. And mm -hmm. that was a tough thing to, to, um, to maneuver, to, yeah. to get them to buy in on, mm. no, we're not going to track you when you go home. We're not going to track you after this. It, it's you're fine. Yeah, this is really good. And, and once we've proven that, once we showed the data and, and instituted on the first one, again, it was wildfire where it spread. So a takeaway, that's awesome. A <laughs> takeaway there is that a pilot, maybe before they're fully trusting this visual digital workflow management system, um, a pilot kind of helped them feel the benefit, feel the results before you went. 
across the, the hospital and into other systems. Absolutely. That is such a fun story. <laughs> Thank you for telling me that. Yeah. Um, I'm curious how you became a, a VP of continuous improvement. Um, and maybe before you answer that, touch on what got you interested in this space in the first place. So kind of what your entree was into the space and how you, how you got to be a VP of continuous improvement at Air Methods. Yeah. So it, it, getting into this was, um, kind of born and raised into it. I went mm. to school for industrial engineering and Great. it, I'm one of the few that I've talked to that my schooling is actually what I do for a living. Yeah. Which is very rare. <laughs> yeah. these days. Um, and so you don't really see a lot of that. So I go to school for, for English, but then you're like a biotech you mm -hmm. know, assistant or something. So there, there's a lot of those, um, that I've come across, but once I went to, into college, it just, it clicked. And I think a lot of what I found in that er, in those early stages was lean six Sigma continuous improvement, whatever you want to call it just made sense. And so a lot of it was just common sense processes. Mm -hmm. And I started in manufacturing because that's where you typically go. This sure. was, you know, a hundred years ago, but you start in manufacturing. And again, to your point, everything's visual. We're doing five S tools. We're doing process mapping. We're doing all of these different things. And what really gravitated me was when I moved into healthcare at the hospital setting. Uh, and I've been in healthcare for, I guess, probably over 15 years. Mm. Going from a, what we call a widget, you, you can move a widget through a process very quickly, very easily. You can understand what that looks like. A lot of data you can manipulate, you can do pilots, you can, you can do all that. Mm -hmm. When you get into healthcare, the patient's moving through the system. Yeah. So the patient is not a widget. And that to me was the most fascinating piece of, of it where how do I then take away the rigidity of this? And this I'm getting to where it became the VP, but yeah. take away the rigidity. Um, and you have to adapt and you have to uh, be flexible to what the situation is. Uh, quick story. I made a very grave mistake. Uh -huh. uh, my first project uh, in a hospital. I was tasked to help the lab and I said, okay, you're coming from manufacturing, go in the lab. It's manufacturing. It's a bunch of vials, super easy. Mm -hmm. And when we were going through that, we were talking about patients and, and, and others. And I made the mistake of calling the patient a widget. Oh, no. And I was just lambasted by the nurses and mm -hmm. you know, dare you, they're people, they're, they're human, they're, they're nice. suffering. And, and yeah. I, I mean, I didn't process it that way. And so since then, it's like, no, that they're, they're human beings. And how do we have a different feel towards that process, towards that organization, towards that culture, than just black and white, black and white, you just move it and you get, if a patient needs to stay another couple of days or if the lab work needs to get to the front of the line because of a, an urgent situation, we're going to do that and compromise on the process and not just be so peer to the math of Six Sigma and Lean. Yes. And is it the most efficient? No. Is it the most bought in? Yes. And that is where I, I applied all of that. And then, <laughs> right. That's awesome. I love that. And then coming into Air Methods, I, I've, I've always had that approach. Um, certified change manager. I've uh, certified trained a trainer. So I've always had this change management people side. And a lot of my old Six Sigma colleagues that I've worked with in the past, they were brilliant technically you couldn't ad adopt a process to save their life because they were just not good at change management. And that was one of the reasons why I, I became the VP was I knew how to communicate with, with people. I knew how to collaborate. I knew how to be flexible and adaptable that it wasn't just a rigid, okay, we got to do this. We got to, you know, phase gate to make process. It was very much a, okay, we got to drop everything and, and now do this. Um, at times, our organization tends to be reactive. We're in healthcare. We're in emergency healthcare. That is the nature of it. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be able to pivot um, in that sense. And and that is how I got to to the role I'm at now. And he, I've even pivoted since then. So it's a constant pivot of of things. Where have you pivoted to? Um, now I'm I'm uh, supporting our operations in billing. Mm. So, and we love back office processes. 
<laughs> we really do. Yes. Your digital and business automation. I will uh, I will tell you that we are not digitally optimized by any stretch of the imagination. Well, we just started. That we just started. There we go. Uh, and st- we had some external challenges. We've had some legislative changes. We've mm-hmm. had COVID. We've had inflation. Mm-hmm. We've had a litany of, of challenges that have come up and made the decision, said, look, we can't support this team at this moment right now as a central dedicated CI team. Mm -hmm. We need to take the strong CI people, which we have a very Mm -hmm. small team. and We had to disperse them into critical areas of the organization. Mm -hmm. How do you determine the critical area that that was executive leadership? Executive leadership said we need to start with billing. Yeah. And I had talk about luck. So when I started there, the first project was billing. Yeah. Because that was super common. Right. So that that's where it was started. It was untouched for decades. Mm -hmm. which was very bizarre, but, and so we started there. So my, my journey as a CI professional at their method started at at the billing center. Well, I think it's a very natural evolution to go from your background now into digital business Mm -hmm. transformation, business automation, and supernatural to start with billing. Um, how far along your journey are you in your billing optimization life cycle or, or journey? Um, have you mapped it out? Have you mined it? Have you identified some opportunities for improvement, some quick wins? Um, what's your kind of process that you're going through? Um, so the journey has been up and down. So five years ago when I started, it was nothing. And so we did assessments, we did workshops. We tried to understand where do we need to optimize the, these process we had as Per usual, you had a lean consultant come in mm-hmm. and they said, here's what you need to do. I was a product of their results. So um, we did that. I We got the place not fully optimized, but to a place where I essentially worked myself out of a job. And I was moonlighting and supporting corporate projects. So I mm-hmm. did large projects within HR, um, some clinical projects. So I was taking a step out of billing because they were self-sustained. Good. Which was great. My, great I'm great. successful in not having to be there anymore, Yeah, which is a very weird feeling. But if I don't need it, then I've done my job. Same with our company. Right. When we work ourselves out of a job, that's the highest honor we could possibly. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's a win. Totally get that. And uh, not a lot of people appreciate that or, or uh, are okay with that. Yeah. It's counterintuitive. <laughs> very. And uh, so we were very good, but the sustainability, as you can imagine, is always the hardest. Mm-hmm. And so it was sustained for a couple of years and we've had external factors. We've had internal leadership changes and it was time to come back. Mm-hmm. And so I, I came back at the beginning of the year and we've done some tremendous um, digging, mapping. Um, in fact, I'm doing a workshop or part of a workshop today, digging into uh, a little bit of our uh, front end processes to mm-hmm. understand where can we automate? Yeah. Where can we make this better? What can we do? Um, how do purchase orders come in? How do invoices come in? How many <laughs> come in? How different are they? Right. How standardized are they? Right. What can we automatically classify versus what requires human intervention? Mm-hmm. That sounds like a, a great workshop. <laughs> we yes. love those workshops. Yes. <laughs> so it's, it's a little bit of um, what we've done a lot, but there's still a lot left to do. Uh, as, as you can, as you can imagine, and trying to do with the people that we have and trying to make sure that we have the right people in the right place, mm. not less people, not more people. If it, if the processes dictate that great, we're going to go up or down depending, but understanding, you know what, you've been doing this for a long time, but I see you're really good at that. Do you want to mm. explore that cool. and having those conversations? So which is really kind of cool because you're, you're not looking at it from a pure black and white process mapping. Mm-hmm. We're digging in and saying, okay, you know what? Yeah. This isn't working out because we feel like you're better over here. So let's have that conversation and see if that makes sense mm-hmm. and do that. And that's it, your human element. Yes, absolutely. And that's been relatively over the last uh, few weeks. So it's, it's been great to have that journey. Well, I'm very <laughs> optimistic for you in that project. A um, couple rapid fire questions yeah. as we wrap up here. Absolutely. Um, let's say if you had a, a crystal ball for this project, this billing mm-hmm. automation project, 
Um, and it's telling you what things look like and feel like, say, two years from now. What does that look like? What does that feel like? Uh, to me, it, it, the manual data entry is eliminated. Great. I mean, to summarize it in that way, that, that's what I would want to see in a couple of years. And then what is the, call it human capital, that today does that manual data entry? Are they, we're repurposing them to mm-hmm. higher value, more strategic collaboration, partnering tasks. Yes, absolutely. I would love to see them as... Uh, enjoying their job more. Enjoying the, enjoying the Not job. working 60, 80 hours a week. Right. And selfishly as, as a, as a black belt, having a, a lot of black belts throughout the company. Oh, that would be And cool. so converting them into doing more CI projects because CI should not be done by the CI team or the CI person. Yes. Them, they should be able to do all that on their own yes. with training, coaching, obviously. But right. instead of doing this manual data entry, they could take a step back, look at the data, look at the analytics, look at their reports and say, you know what? We need to dive in here and do that. I don't need to call you. I'm going to go do that. That's, that's really where those people should be. Empowerment. Love that. Um, okay. Last rapid fire question. If you could, um, create a billboard for everyone at this conference to see (laughs) on their way out and they, they get it, they internalize that billboard. Um, what would it say? I I alluded to it at the, at the top, but continuous improvement is a mindset. I think that that's, if they take nothing away other than that, that's, that's it. That's, great. that's the billboard. Well, thank you so much for the time. Absolutely. This was thank a lot you. of fun. This was great. I appreciate it. Best. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thanks for listening to another episode of Bots and Thoughts, the hyper automation podcast sponsored by Salient Process. Be sure to never miss an episode by hitting that subscribe button wherever you're listening to this Get your hands on more content like this by following us on LinkedIn and YouTube down in the show notes and say hello. We'd love to hear your thoughts, perhaps even on an upcoming episode. Stay tuned for more episodes of Bots and Thoughts, the hyper automation podcast brought to you by Salient Process.